exactly 18 days. 18 days. So it's one of those things that whenever it does happen, it makes sense to take action. Hello everyone, Benjamin Cowan talks about Bitcoin risk metric. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. The 0.8 to 1 risk bands. So whenever Bitcoin goes to those risk bands, it tends to be a pretty good idea to scale out of the market. Now, that doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't eventually go higher. As you can see in 2013, we went to the 0.8 to 0.1 to wristbands. We cooled off and then we went up there again. But when the market cooled off, it might not look like it, but the price to Bitcoin during that drop was like 80% or something. It might have even been more than that. And essentially, every single time that the risk of Bitcoin goes to the 0.8 to 1 wristbands, Within the next, say, 6 to 12 months, Bitcoin tends to drop somewhere between like 70 to 85 to 90 percent. In, you know, when Bitcoin was younger, it was more so dropping 90 percent. And then here it was like 87 and then here it was 84. And then I think last cycle it was 77. So, you know, in the same way that you get diminishing returns, you also see diminishing losses, which is a good thing. I mean, you you know, as, as it goes on, the volatility does start to, to shrink, which in some ways is not good for people that want to get cheaper valuations, but in other ways, for hodlers that just want to keep DCAing, right, you don't want to see your portfolio drop 80% every four years. So perhaps it would be a good thing if, if that didn't have to happen every four years. But there will likely be drops like that in the future. Um, and so it's important to recognize that whenever that happens, it's probably time to start running for the hills, right? Um, now, the risk on Bitcoin right now is right around 0.6, okay? So it's in kind of that that intermediate zone where, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it's hard to say, right? It, it's sort of like it could go, you know, it could do either, right? I mean, there's, there's times where like in 2019, where Bitcoin only goes up to sort of the 0.6 risk level. I think it actually went up to like 0.685 if you look at, at some of the, the intraday wicks. Um, and if you look at where, where Bitcoin went in March of this year, it actually went up to the 0.7 to 0.8 risk band. And, and back then, I remember telling people that this would likely be a mid-cycle top. Not because, and I didn't say a market cycle top, I said a mid-cycle top. Because gold was breaking out, USDT dominance was hitting its long-term trend line, and I got your guys' messages, I know it's there again, I don't need 100 more, I got 100 today and 100 yesterday, I don't need to keep hearing it, I understand, right? Um, but that was the reason, right? I mean, we looked at it and said, all right, well, you know, it's hit 0. 0.7 to 0. 0.8 risk. Gold's breaking out. USDT dominance is at its trend line. It's probably going to be a mid-cycle top. So not every rally by Bitcoin goes to the 0.8 to 1 wristbands, right? Not every rally does. And, and that's the reason why sometimes it can make sense to sort of dynamically sell out as the wristbands go up, right? So what a lot of people would want to do, if we go look at the risk levels like this, where we take sort of the, the color code out of it and just look at the single metric, what a lot of people want to do, which is not necessarily a bad strategy, as long as you have a long enough time frame in mind, is that they only sell whenever Bitcoin goes to the 0.8 to 1 wristbands. Everything that happens in between this spike and this spike is completely irrelevant, right? It does not matter. Whenever this spike occurs... You wait until it goes back to lower risk levels, and then you buy, and um, and and you just wait for it to go back up to that wristband eventually. And eventually, it typically does. Um, but if you want to take advantage of some of sort of the market, sort of the moves within the cycle, you do occasionally get tops like this, 
where it looks like it might go up to the 0.8 to 1 wristband. It's rallying a lot, but then it just kind of fades before it gets there. And so what I did in 2019 was I sold some when it went to the 0.6 to 0.7 wristband, but it wasn't a lot, right? It was only approximately, I think, like one-tenth of my Bitcoin position back then. And and it might have been a little bit more. I can't remember exactly. It was around that amount. And I remember thinking when I sold it, I was like, you know, why why am I doing this? You know, I mean, it, it just seems like Bitcoin should be able to go a lot higher. But then nine months later, I felt like a genius when Bitcoin was trading at $3,800. And then I was able to, you know, that 10% that I sold was then able to get just that 10% was able to get, you know, three time, three to four times the amount of Bitcoin by just sitting and, and waiting for, for, for that move. Now, the reality is I didn't wait until $3,800 to sort of redeploy. I started redeploying after it went back below the 0.5 risk level. Right, so that's essentially what I did, um, and and that works out pretty well, right? You know, DCAing below the 0.5 risk level. If you're more conservative, you could say DCA below the 0.4 risk level. If you're even more conservative, you could DCA below, say, like the 0.2 risk level, or lump sum, if you will, right? So lump sum anytime it's below 0.2. And then forget about it, go enjoy your life, and then check back in whenever it's, you know, back above 0.8. If we are being honest, that's probably one of the better strategies, right? Whenever it goes down to those risk levels, lump sum, and then forget about it. But practically speaking, you know, you bring in money every single month. You, you know, you don't have, you don't always have the luxury to just lump sum everything at the market cycle bottom, but that also doesn't mean that you should miss out on every move after that because you didn't buy at those risk levels. And so it can make sense to sort of DCA up to higher risk levels, right? You know, you could say up to 0.4, up to 0.5. Some people DCA up to 0.6. A common question I get from people is, well, what if you're new and you don't have a Bitcoin position and, you know, the risk is already high? My sort of go-to response to that is that you can always DCA if you don't have any Bitcoin, um, even if the risk level is higher than what you otherwise would. And then in in subsequent years, you then only start to DCA. You sort of lower your, your range that you're willing to DCA in. So, you know, and also I would, I would think, you know, if you're going to use a strategy like this, it makes sense to DCA up to a certain level and then sort of have a, a gray region where you neither buy nor sell, right? So that way you're not like flip-flopping every couple of weeks because you don't really want to necessarily deal with the tax implications of something like that. So let's say you only bought Bitcoin up to 0.4 risk and then you only sold it above 0.6 or something. That way, you know, when it's between these levels, you're not doing anything but just sitting on your hands and waiting for the next move. So what I've learned with Bitcoin, and you've probably noticed this if you followed me long enough, is that I I certainly can't predict where the market's going to go. Um, the, the you know my best predictions are are typically related to sort of things like um, the Satoshi valuation of altcoins, where Bitcoin dominance is going to go. That stuff seems a lot more predictable to me. The altcoin USD valuations are a lot more difficult to predict because they're more dependent on Bitcoin. And a lot of them, even when Bitcoin goes up, altcoin USD pairs can go down. So altcoin USD pairs, alt USD pairs are really difficult to predict, but alt Bitcoin pairs are a lot easier. I I thought that ETH was going to go home and it didn't, right? I mean, it, it rallied instead. And, you know, I... I hedged and I, I, I bought some ETH, uh, you know, a, a few weeks ago before the rally. And of course, I, I tell people that I bought, but I did have a theory that I thought it was going to go home and which is the lower logarithmic regression trend line. And then it didn't. So I have people dunking on me, which is fine. That's that's just part of the game. And you you sort of learn to accept it. But it's also one of those things where, like, I don't mind all the time being dunked on when I'm wrong as long as I hedged myself and made money along the way, right? So it's fine to be rich and wrong. 
that's a lot better. It's a lot better to sort of put your dignity aside because at the end of the day, we're here to make money. We're not here to be right, you know? If you want to be right, you know, go to grad school or something. I did that, right? I did that for for five years and, um, and here I am, right? So, uh, you know, being right is one thing. And, and being right about this kind of stuff at the end of the day is not going to matter. It's more about, you know, how do you manage your portfolio? Are you throwing all your money into stuff that's just bleeding against Bitcoin? Or are you sticking with the king in a Bitcoin dominance uptrend? That doesn't mean Bitcoin can't go down. It just means that whenever it does go down, it generally presents a good opportunity, Right? There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you know, if you think about it, if you go to a store, you like it when things are on sale. Right? You're more likely to buy it if, if it's on sale. Um, if it's not on sale, maybe you wouldn't. But if it is, then you're more likely to buy it. But in the cryptoverse, if things are on sale, people freak out. Right? They freak out. They get, they get really worried about what's going on in the market. And, and they don't want to buy when things are on sale. So... What I would say in general is that the risk metric, I think, is is really useful for helping to take emotions out of it. And it's not the only thing that you can use to do it. There's other things you can use as well, but it is really helpful. The one thing I will say is that, you know, while it does tend to go to the 0.8 to 1 wristband every few years, it doesn't spend a lot of time there. So if you were to go look at the time in the wristbands, right? So you remember earlier this year when we went to the 0.7 to 0.8 wristband? If you go to time in wristbands, you can see for all the for all cycles that in terms of percentage of the time, Bitcoin only spends about 2.77% of the time in the 0.7 to 0.8 wristband. So that was another reason why back in March, I, I offloaded some a little bit because I'm like, well, I mean, you know, it's not going to spend that much time in these wristbands before it goes back down. And you know, it gets even less for the 0.8 to 0.9, only one one and a half percent of the time. 0.9 to 1, only 0.35% of the time. So in terms of days, out of all the number of days that Bitcoin has been around, Bitcoin has been in the 0.9 to 1 wristband exactly 18 days. 18 days. So it's one of those things that whenever it does happen, it makes sense to take action because it's not going to be a- around forever. Now, I don't know when the next time Bitcoin will go to the 0.8 to 1 wristbands, right? I don't know. I mean, it, it could be as early as this month. It could be as, as, as early as January or December. It might take until April. There's a chance it takes until a year from now, right? No one actually knows, but you don't have to know. You don't have to know, right? It's just when it happens, you make your move, right? And when it goes down here, you make your move. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Benjamin Cowan. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.